linear function, okay? We'll concentrate on what the function is, we'll then talk about why these things are called linear, we'll talk about how we can recognize a linear function, um, and we'll just try to approach it starting with the graph, working our way up from there, working our way towards solving equations, okay, things like that. By the way, a couple of my TAs made this beautiful piece of artwork, I think it's a piece of art over here. And you knew where the heading goes. So getting things out of place. Now I'll have it to point out forever. So on the left. Uh, what <coughs> is a graph? Um, a pictorial representation of an algebraic expression. Okay, I would change expression to equation uh, or function. Okay. Okay. Uh, but very good, very good. Yeah, it is a, it's a picture, representation of, uh, in a, well, it's a function too. It's a function, an equation is a function, a set of ordered pairs is a function, a, an xy table is a function. A function is anything that you can have some kind of input and get output, okay? Uh, and a graph is just a picture of that. Um, so just picture representation, how is it a picture representation? What's it made of? Yeah. Bam, bunch of points. Exactly, bam, a bunch of points. That should really be this. You, you, okay. So it's a, let's say it's a picture of a function. Okay, so in parentheses, I'll remind us what a function is. <coughs> What's a function? something in, put something out, right? Input, output, simple as that. If you can put something into it and get something out of it, it is a mathematical function. Right? Vending machines, mathematical function. Gas pumps, equations, graphs, tables, ordered pairs. Right? It's just a bunch of points. It's a bunch of points. How many points? Infinite. Infinite number of points. Not three, not five, not a billion, not even a trillion or a quadrillion, but an infinite number of points. What does each point represent? If I put a point there on the graph, what's it represent? Just the input and output. The input and the output. And a particular input gives a particular output. There's a point at 2, 3, at x is 2 and y is 3. That means for that function, whatever function it looks like, whatever equation it might look like, with y and x in it, we put in 2, we get out of 3. Simple. Simple. Okay. It represents um, a particular input. Now this is always true, this is always the case, it's 
never not true. For every graph, it is true. Even three-dimensional graphs, and if it were possible, four-dimensional graphs, and things we don't even have to really worry about. But it's, it's such a simple thing, and if we can remember that, and I can keep reminding you of that, even if you forget it, I can remind you later, and it will make things so much simpler, okay? So, that being said, let's now stop talking about general functions, and let's focus in on one kind of function, and it tr produces one category of graph, right? We'll explore it, and we'll figure out what's the easiest way to draw this graph. What do we, what's the minimum we need to draw this graph? What properties does this function have? Not just its graph, but uh, as an equation, okay? So to do that, let's start with uh, I want you to do these separately. Do that one, then do one other one. So there's a, a couple of functions. Is that 4 over s or 4 over 5? Sorry, that is a 5. It's one of my things. It's one of my character traits. My 5s look like s's. Just remind me. Uh, but yeah, draw two different graphs. Guy here. This one here. You could, I guess you could draw them on the same axes if you wanted to. And we'll just start talking about it. And remember that there are, you can choose what to plug in for x. So don't make things hard on yourself if you don't have to. Choose a value of x that makes this easier. Right? And if you're not sure what that means, that's what we're going to talk about after you uh, plug in some values for x. Because maybe you'll stumble upon it. That's what I hope you do. Okay, let's start with. First guy right here. Like I said, you can choose any value for x you want because it, it's a function. And there, there's, at least on this function, there's no limitations until you plug it for x. So we want to choose easy values for x, Jesse. Probably 0, 5, and negative 5. 0, 5, and negative 5. I like all of these ideas. Now, why is 0 such an easy one to choose? You just you, yeah, you get rid of this x term because 4 fifths times 0 is 0. Anything times 0 is 0. Right? That makes it really easy to not even do any work, really, to realize that we just have 7 left. Okay, let's, look, let's turn to the graph. 0, 7. Okay. You may recognize graphing this point on the y-axis as graphing the y-intercept. Y-intercept. What does the word intercept mean? Just the word intercept. English word intercept. Wherever the line meets the axis. Okay. Where any two, any two things meet, right? You intercept the path, you, your path has met the path of the ball, you Ship can intercept another by cutting it off, getting in front of it, across the paths. We're intercepting. The line, or the, or the graph, let's pretend we're going to line. The graph we're about to draw is going to intercept the y axis at that point. Right? It's going to come along, it's going to go right through the y axis at that point. Now, why is 5 such a good choice? Can we plug in 1? Yeah. 2, 3, 4, so why 5? Because you can cross cancel. Because 5 is, well, it's a multiple <coughs> of 5, right? And we multiply by, when we multiply 4 fifths by 5, uh, let's write this right here, 4 fifths by 5, we can multiply by 5 over 1. And whether you cross cancel the 5s, or you multiply 4 times 5, you get 20 over 5, <coughs> you're going to end up at 4. Right? Let's, let's look at it in, in terms of multiplying the, the, the fractions together. Right, you get 20 over 5. And 20 is divisible by 5. Right? Is it surprising that we got a number that's divisible by 5 in the numerator? Why is that not surprising? Because we chose to multiply by 5. We chose to multiply by 5. Right? If I include a factor of 5, then I'm sure that the numerator is going to be divisible by 5, the denominator that we're given. 
So it's divisible by 5, which is a really good choice. 4 plus 7 is 11. Okay, let's see what that looks like over here. Well, we're here at 7. We're going to go to a y of 11, right? How many more do I have to go up from 7 to get to 11? Or do I have to go up? Four more up, right? <coughs> this looks familiar. If you graph lines before, yeah? We're going up four. One, two, three, four. And now we're going, how many X's are we going this way? Five. Five. Rise over run. Rise over run, exactly. That's what we're leading, leading toward. So one, two, three, four, over five. Not because it's magic, not because that's what you're supposed to do with lines. How this function acts, how it behaves, how it works. Right? Now, let's just say that that's all we know, just those points, right? We don't know what the graph looks like because we haven't plotted all those points yet. Which I think we don't know it's a line. Okay, so we plug in negative 5. Well, all this stuff is the same. We got negative, we got negative 20 over 5, we got negative 4. So instead of adding 4 and going to the right 5, we're going to subtract 4. Going to the left five. Right? Start at seven, we're going to subtract four from seven. And that happens when we put in an x of negative five. Now one, two, th one, two, three, four, five. All right, so yeah, let's rise over run in case you uh, weren't catching that. Um, so we've got three points so far. Pretending we don't know anything about what this graph is supposed to look like. What is it starting to look like? A straight line. A straight line. Could it just happen to be a curve that has three points that happen to be straight in a row? Could be. You just Pretty have to plot one of them. 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 Negative 15 is good. Negative 10 is good. There's not really any bad choices, right? Let's see what happens if I choose, say, negative 6. Just go one past negative 5. If I choose negative 6, here's what happens. I am not going to get a multiple of 5 in the numerator, so it's not going to be divisible, divisible by 5, so that's not going to be so great. I'm going to get negative 24 over 5. So close. Not quite. Plus 7. Uh, well, to add 7 to negative 24 fifths without chickening out and using a calculator and reporting decimals, staying in fractions, we have to get what? Common denominator. Common denominator. This is 7 over 1. What denominator do we need? 5. So this is going to be what over 5? 35. 35 over 5. Negative 24 over 5 plus 35 over 5 is. 11 fifths. Okay, so I put in negative 6, I get out 11 fifths. That is absolutely 100% true. What's the bummer about that? <coughs> it's hard, it's hard, hard to, to find. Out. It's hard to graph, it's hard to find. Uh, it's harder to add, right? Not that hard. We have to find a common denominator, though. And we get these fractions, which are hard to graph. It's very difficult it's to graph. When we have it like that, it's better to change it from a mixed time to a just a simplify a little number. bit. Yeah. So two and one fifth? Yeah. It helps to graph it. It helps to be able to plot it exactly right. right if I were to do that, I'd go negative six, and I'm going to go two and one fifth. And it's about right there. But I'm, I'm already kind of guessing when I'm graphing this. My graph is not 100% precise, is it? I'm just sketching it out. And so now I'm guessing at where one fifth is, two and one fifth. So it's not great. Since you know the rise over run, can't you just go down another four into Pretending the that we don't know this is a line. Okay. But yes. Once we arrive at that, like, oh, well, all of these kinds of functions that look like this all do the same thing. Right? We want to notice that. We want to notice that. So negative 10 is a great idea. Why? Because when we put negative 10 here, or any multiple of 5, then it's going to cancel with this denominator of 5. We're going to get a multiple of 5, and it's going to be divisible by 5. So here we're going to get negative. 40 over 5. 
I don't need this. It can just be 7 like it was to start with. Negative 40 over 5, that's negative 8. That's Please excuse the interruption. Please release the juniors and seniors to go to the college fair. If I have a good time. Juniors and seniors to go to the college fair. Thank you. So when we plugged in negative 5, it canceled the 5 and left us with minus 4, right? Exactly what the numerator was to start with. So we subtract 4 from 7. When we plug in negative 10, that's 2 times 5. We wind up getting 2 times 4, or negative 2 times 4. And we get negative 8, so now we're subtracting 8 from 7. Subtract 4 from 7, subtract 8 from 7. If we put in negative 15, seven, we're going to get negative 45 over 5, or negative 60, sorry, negative 60. 5 and 7, that's going to be minus 12, right? We're subtracting 4, we're subtracting 8, we're subtracting 12, that's 4 times 3. And if we were to put negative 15, we would get 7 minus 12, and negative 5. Negative 5. So we plotted a point, let's plot another point, negative 10, that's 7, 8, 9, 10, and negative 1. Okay, right there. We can go positive 10. But if we take note that every time we move a step of five in the horizontal direction to the left or to the right, the pattern is we just add on or subtract how much? Four. We just keep going. And if we move to the right or left in increments of five, starting from our previous point, we'll just go up in increments of four or down in increments of four. Okay. Question. Let's go the other direction and go positive 10. Yeah, that's, it might look nicer, but it's not wrong, yeah. We just keep going. The only reason we write this table down is so that we don't have to do the work again. We just know, when we put this in, we can get this out. And if we need to know what we get when we put 10 in there, then uh, that's what we'll do. And if we put 10 in there, if we put 10, that's gonna cancel with five, right? Now this is getting faster, because we're realizing the shortcut that we're utilizing. We put 10 in there, that's going to cancel with 5. 10 divided by 5 is what? 2. We're going to add 2 times 4. That's 8. We're going to add that to 7. 15. What's that? 15. 15. 15. So we're going to go after 10. That's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And we go to 1, 2, 3, 4. All I did was go up four from my previous point. Let's make sure I got to 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this slope is just, is, it's not that this is the next point. It's just the next easiest point to find. And this is the next easiest point to find here. As we showed by plugging in negative 6, there are points in between this point and that point. How many are there between that and that? infinite number. You might think one, two, three, four, but there's also points in between those points and points in between those points that are in between the points. And we just keep going and getting smaller and smaller. And there's an infinite number of points between these two points, between these two points, between any two points, and beyond the points that we plotted. So now we've plot plotted a bunch of points and notice that every time we plug in a multiple of five, we add four more to the previous <coughs> result. Or if we go in the negative direction, we subtract 4 from the previous result. You notice that this is going to produce a line. It's just going to keep stepping up. Every time I put in the next multiple of 5, I'm going to add 4 more to the previous result. Okay? That's why there's a slope, because that's just the way the function behaves. Okay? We use that word for functions like they're people, uh, but we like to anthropomorphize things. So that's what we do. It behaves in that way. Up, make it over. Goes up this much for every over. It's fairly linear. What's that? Looks fairly linear. It is linear. It is a line. So that's why these are called linear functions.
So that function in that equation is a linear function because it, it has this behavior. It has just up and over, up and over, up and over. And we don't have to go up four and over five. We could go up ten, or sorry, up eight and over ten. Right? That's the same thing. It's the same mm -hmm. ratio of up to over, rise to run, vertical to horizontal. Four, five, eight, ten, or even smaller. Like we went up um, one. What's that? Two, two, point five. two and two point five. Two and two point five. Still, it's a four to five ratio. Okay. And because moving, like putting an x that's a multiple of five, well, x is horizontal. Okay, so we're going to put in 5, 10, 15, that's why we're stepping over, that's our run. Okay? And every time we do that, we cancel out this 5, and we get the next multiple of 4, that's why we're moving up, we're rising by 4 each time. So, <clears throat> now that we understand that, we realize that these functions are going to produce line graphs. Now we can say, what's the minimum number of points that we need to graph a line? Three points? Any fewer points that we can use? How about two, right? If I have two points and I draw a line, if it truly is supposed to be a line, won't that third point land on that line anyway? Yeah. Okay. And before we do this one, just one last question. When I draw this line, what is that line? Infinity, goes on forever. And the right. ending line? <coughs> yeah, because of these arrows, it goes on in, in both directions. And what's this line made of? <laughs> Points. points. It's made of points. All those points are points we could have found by plugging something in for x and getting out the y. We just don't have time to do all that. We barely had time to do all these, right? That took a long time, and that's only a few points. So we save time. We say all of the points we could ever plot are going to land on this line. That's what the drawing the shape part is. It's the guessing of the rest of the points. So this guy right here, the second one, what kind of a shape do you think it's going to make? Probably a, Probably a line because we can look at it as like we start at negative 3, and every time we plug in a multiple of, <coughs> doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a negative, it's going to be positive, and then the uh, minus 3 and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so if you put a negative, it's going to be down to the negative and all that. I guess my question is, what, what are the easiest things to plug in for x? Multiples of 7. <coughs> multiple of 7. So every time I plug in a multiple of 7, I'm going to move vertically by how much? 5. By 5, right? Oh, if I move over by 7 twice, put in an x of 14, I'll move up. Well, I'll move down. Yeah. 5. Because uh, yeah. Yeah, when you're doing rise over run, you have to put the negative, like, one of them can be either negative 5 or negative that's a good question. Let's, let's take a look at that. Let's first do some inputs and outputs and then see if it even makes it. Okay. Let's be shift. Okay, first we'll do zero. Okay? Plug in zero for x, get negative three, right? Easy. I can just look at that and tell. Okay. Then we'll plug in seven. Well, if I plug in seven, that seven's gonna cancel with this seven, or you could think of it as getting 35 over seven. Either way. You wind up with five there, right? Five. You multiply that by a negative. You get negative five. So we get negative three minus five. Negative three minus five. Negative eight. Negative eight. One, two, three, four, five. Five, six, seven. There is a point that belongs on this graph. It's a collection of infinite points. What did I do wrong? Okay, fair enough. There we go. Uh -huh. okay. Now let's go negative seven. Okay. Negative seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, I put a negative seven in there. That's gonna that's gonna be, that's gonna leave a negative one here when you multiply by negative seven. So negative one times five. Negative five times negative. Positive five. So now we're adding five. We'll add five to negative three. One, two, three, 
4, 5. And the negative 7 gave us that 2. Okay. So now we can answer Tyler's question. Should we give the negative to the rise or to the run if we were just going to plot this using the slope? The what? It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. Okay, let's see. Let's go ahead and draw this line. We know this would be a line by now. So we constantly just get this ratio of up 5 and over 7, down 5 and over 7. Uh, even if we move to the tiniest little increments, we're still going to move down and over by that ratio. So this, that's going to create a line. Uh, okay, so is it is the slope, we'll call it m, negative 5 over positive 7, or is it 5 over negative 7? Let's take a look. Let's start here. Okay, let's do this one. This would be this would be a negative rise, correct? We're going to move in increments of five down. What did you go five? And then the denominator is the run. It's positive, so we're going to move to the right seven. There we are at that point. Well, so it seems like it's negative five over seven. So let's try the other one. It's five over negative seven. So that would mean that the, our rise is positive, up five, and our run is negative, so that'd be to the left seven. So it doesn't matter. So that makes sense. It's good. The, these, these numbers are the same. Negative 5 divided by 7, negative 5 sevens, right? Negative divided by positive is negative. 5 divided by negative 7, still a negative 5 sevens. They're both negative fractions. So now we can kind of generalize all linear functions will look like this. Where this guy will tell us like the up and over pattern, the stepping motion, the ratio of the up to the over, the rise over the run slope. Okay. That guy that's multiplied by x will give us the slope. Okay, pausing here for a second. If that slope is positive, then what can we expect, expect the line to look like? The slope is positive. Just going up as going up as you move to the right, up and to the right. Okay, Left to right, that's how we read, so that's how we like to look at things. Move left to right, we're moving up, or you might call that rises, that's what the book calls it, calls it rises. What if it's negative? It falls, yeah, it goes from left to right, it goes down. Okay. This would be all positive slopes go up. Rise, meaning from left to right. Left to right. And negative slopes would go down as you go from left to right. right. Plus some other number. When your function is this simple, this is kind of like your starting point. If you do that as the, the point on the y-axis, that's what you, that's, this is just what you get when you plug in what for x? So this zero. zero. If you plug in zero for x, you'll just get this guy here. That's why it's the y-intercept, because that's when x is zero. That's true of all y-intercepts for every function, right? Does that make sense? If we're on the y-axis, we've plugged in zero for x. So if we're crossing the y-axis, that's where x is zero. Justin? What if you have like two for m? Two, then we could view that as two over one. Right? Yeah. And so we have a rise of two and over one. Let's finish this up real quick and we'll look at that. So this is what we call our y-intercept. <laughs> which is almost obvious because we're plugging zero for x, and that's what we should get back out. Okay. What if we do have a 2 for m? y equals 2x and plus 4. 2x plus 4. This is like 2 over 1. Right? Do I need to plug mm -hmm. anything special for x to cancel out this 1? No. No. Everything's a multiple of 1, right? Put in, well, maybe we don't want to put in 3.5, then we're just like choosing to make life harder ourselves. But we can plug in anything, and just multiply by 2, this is just what we get. So our, our increment that we move over in the x direction can just be 1s. We move over by 1s, rather than by 5s or by 4s, or 7s or whatever. So we plug in 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, whatever we like. Zero will give us four. What will one give us? It's just two times one plus four. So two. It'll give us two, and we add four, we get six. 
Plug in two, we get four. Two times two is four, plus four. Eight. What do you think we'll get when we plug in three? Ten. Ten, right? We just keep stepping up in twos. We keep adding two more to four. We add two, we add two more, we add two more. Now we come to negative one. Two. When you go to two, right, we're going back the other direction. So we should be subtracting two from four, and then subtract two from that. Zero. And then subtract two from that. And subtract two from that, subtract two from that. If we you know, go in steps of ones. If we were to look at the graph, we got a y-intercept of four, right? That's the easiest point to just grab. Free of charge. It's so easy to just take that point out. That's why we've been taught. Plot the y-intercept, because it's so easy to see what it is, and then follow the slope. Because that's where you're really just choosing the next easiest value to plug in for x, and then adding whatever the numerator is to the y-intercept. Right? The easiest to plug in here is just 1. You don't have to really be very choosy like we did in the previous examples. So we can just move over 1. That means we're going to add 2 more to 4. We're going to be at 6. There we have it. Two points. That's all we need. Two points to draw a line. I could plot all these points in between here, but I have to choose 5, 2, 5, 7, 5. Those aren't going to be very easy to use. 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5 wouldn't be too hard. 0. 0.5 times 2 is 1, so 4 plus 1 is 5. So that was a good coincidence, or a good choice, I guess. But we could spend our entire lifetimes plugging in 0. 0.5, plugging in 1.5, plugging in 4, plugging in 7, and plotting all these points. But we just wind up putting points right on this line that I've drawn. So it would just be kind of a waste of time now that we know where all the points will be. Um, well, this has been great so far. Why don't we take a little break? A two minute break, how about that? Uh, so let's review, just before the break, what it is we've, we've uh, done, okay? Um, what does a linear function look like in equation form? Just jump in there. Simple recitation there. Y equals mx plus b. If you can get your function to look like that, you've got a linear function. Okay. So here's a question: Is x plus y equals five a linear function? Yes. yes no. Does it look like this, but could it look like this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How could we get it to look like that? Subtract. Oh, I got the uh, over here, yeah. 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 How do we do that? How do we accomplish that? Subtract. Subtract x from both sides, right? Yeah. These are some solving equations basics. Subtract the same thing from both sides. Here we go. So is this a linear function? Yeah. Yes, it is. Negative 1 over 1 times plus 5. There we go, negative yep. 1 over 1 times x plus 5. So if we wanted to graph that, we got our y-intercept. Okay, there's that point on the y-axis. What is that? Remember, each point represents something. What does this represent about the function? Input 0. Input 0. Output 5. Give 5. Okay, so we put in zero and we got out five. That's what that point represents. Yes. Okay, uh, now we plug in, say, one, and that's going to give us negative one times one. Uh, we're going to subtract that from five. So as we put in one for x, we subtract one from five and we're down to four. And we can move down and over one again. And we can do this forever, but who really needs to because that's enough. Enough information to be able to say all of the points will land right here on this line. Okay. So that's what a linear function looks like. If you can get it to look like that, then it's a linear function. Okay. Um, let's, see. let's look at a linear function in a different form. And we won't rewrite it. We won't try and get it to look like y equals mx plus b. Because right? if, you, if you have something times x plus something times y equals something, you could rewrite that as y equals mx plus b, right? Yeah. You could subtract.
subtract that thing that's times x, you could divide by b, y will be by itself, you'll have a number times x plus some number, right? Those numbers might be strange, funky fractions, but it'll be a linear function. But if we, if, if we use it like this, leave it like this, let's say we have negative 4x plus 5y equals 20. You gotta think of it like, it's, it's a game. We're trying to graph this thing that we know is supposed to be a line. What is the minimum we need to draw a line? Two points. So we need to just pick the easiest way to find two points. Now in this case, back here, say for these guys, the easiest thing to do would be plug in zero for x, and then use the pattern that we've noticed, this slope pattern, and know that every time I plug in a, net, the, uh, a multiple of five, I'll move up four more, or a negative multiple of five will move down four more. My previous answer. Well here, that's not, Maybe the easiest thing to do. Well, what would be something very easy, maybe to plug in for x and then you'll know what y is? Easy. You can plug in for x0 and for y0. Okay, so we can plug in for x0, let's start with that. 5y then equals 20. If I plug in 0 for x, that term just goes away. And I'm left with 5y equals 20. So that tells me that if I put in 0, what do I get out for y? 4. 4. Easy. Right? I have a point. I'm halfway there. I just need to see. <coughs> Justin, what did you say? And then zero for y. Okay, that might be something that you didn't really think of because normally we plug things in for x, but we don't have to plug something in for x. We can plug stuff in for y as well. Right? And in this case, that becomes a very easy thing to do. Negative four x equals twenty. So now the y term has gone away. X equals negative five. X is negative five when y is zero. Do we have enough to draw a line? Mm -hmm. We got two points. It's negative five, zero, and zero, four. There's two points, draw a line. We don't have to worry about it. Yes. Why is it that when you get rid of the x, the y is the opposite of the number that we Oh, uh, coincidence? Coincidence? Yeah. They just chose it that way. If I had made this positive 4, it wouldn't have been the case. This would have been positive 4 still. And this would have been positive 5. And of course, I mean, think about, I want to write this as a simple one, right? I want to make sure that this number is divisible by 5 and by 4. So when we go to solve for x or y, it's an easy thing to do. You don't get some weird fraction. I can do anything. I can do negative four plus five y equals seventeen. So now our answers are like seventeen, negative seventeen fourths and seventeen fifths. So yeah, it's just a coincidence made by me. It's not something we can really use in general. So sometimes it's not exactly the best to try to get it to make it look like uh, y equals mx plus b. But sometimes it's just better to keep it uh, the way it is. Sometimes we don't need to do that because we can simply plug in 0 for x, 0 for y, that's a lot faster than Why making it look that way. It's less complicated. Less com yeah, yeah, less complicated than getting y by itself. But then sometimes it would be easier to get y by itself. Right? It would be sometimes. Like, just for example, real quick, and I'm just going to erase it so I don't confuse anybody. But if I had y minus 4 fifths x equals 7, I'm just going to add 4 fifths x to both sides and get y to the limit plus b rather than plug in 0 for y and then try and solve for x at that time. y is already by itself. It's not two lines, not three lines, just y, one times y. And if I add 4 fifths x, I'll quickly have this. And that would be easy enough to grab. Mm -hmm. okay. Erase that. So again, it's just a game of finding two points, the easiest way to find two points. Uh, what's the slope of this line? Um, y equals negative Just the slope. Just the slope. Justin? Four fifths. Just four over five. Four over five, that's the slope. That's the rise over the rise. Right. Uh, what's the equation in slope intercept for? Y equals negative four fifths. Agree to that? 
we can just check it by looking at the graph, right? This should be our y-intercept. If we plug in zero, we should get four. We do. Yeah. Now, this negative four-fifths. Oh, it's not negative. Positive? Look at this line. Does it go up or does it go down? What are we talking about? Negative and positive slopes. Which one of them goes up? Positive. Positive goes up. From left to right, it goes up. From right to left, it goes down. It becomes read right to left, read right to left to right. So let me just put a positive in that sense to work. If I start at a point and go up four and over five, up four and to the right five, I get another point. That's the nature of the slope. That's what the slope is. a couple of lines to graph in a couple of different forms, and I will switch people to take care of that. Um, find two points, right? There's, it's the easiest graph you can possibly think of other than maybe like a single point. That would be an easy graph to do. But other than that, for ones that have like shapes and they go on forever, the line would be the easiest one and we only need two points. So whatever way you want to find two points, that's up to you. I would choose here to plug in zero for x, figure out what y is, there's a point. Plug in zero for y, eliminate that term and then figure out what x is. This. Zero, comma, I don't know what y is yet. Zero for y, and figure out what x is. So zero for x, that's going to give me negative 4y equals 24. Negative 4y equals 24. Divide by negative 4y equals negative 6. Zero, negative 6. And if I plug in zero for y, well, that's going to give me 3x and x will be positive 8. So I have a point at 8, 0. And all I'm asking for is for you to uh, draw the line. And you've done it. And it's very nice it. If you then want to write the equation of the line, you, you could. You could get y by itself. Or you could just look at the graph and say well, this equals y equals slope, that's 6 over 8, right? Nice and easy. Or 3 over 4. You simplify. 3 fourths x minus 6, because if we plug in 0 for x, we'll get out negative 6. That's what we're supposed to get. And this one, we need two points. This is really how we should be thinking about it. We need two points. What's the easiest First easiest point to find? Zero. Zero for x. X. Put, plug in zero for x. I plug in zero for x, there's nothing there. I subtract seven from nothing. I get negative seven. What would be the next easiest thing to do to plug in for four. x? Four. Right? Move over four, that's our run. Right? The next thing we're going to see is our rise because we're going to multiply by four. That's going to cancel this out. We're just left with negative three. Negative seven minus three. Move, move to the right four, move down three. Okay. Move to the left four, or well, we're just going to go the opposite. We're going to go up three, so we'll be at negative four. Or negative four. But I didn't need those two points. I, I, that point, I just need these two. Or these, any two. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. If I, I can even forget about this, I can go up one, two, three, and over four. One, two, three, four. Yeah. That is four. Uh, oh, sorry. We're supposed to go down three, not up three. Go down three. And to the right four. And there's two points. And I draw this. You can bet that if I look at the graph, I'll find a point on the graph that goes through negative four, four. 
I did this good, I drew a nice picture. Get a negative four fours right there, let's say. That's on the line. Let's say we were to change this to a, a positive three fourths. Let's look at that. y equals three fourths x. Seven. So all I'm doing here is just making up a new equation. Just making it up. Okay, making up a new equation where the slope is three fourths. Let's graph this over here. Seven. We go up one, two, three, and over one, two, three, four. So What should be? The whole line itself. This line. Oh, yeah, the whole line. Yeah, so shouldn't it be because it's in? You're making it um, <coughs> the original one is three fourths x mm -hmm. minus six. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing it minus seven, mm -hmm. you're taking the whole line itself and shifting it down one point. Yes. The, the lines will be identical except for the one with minus seven will be just shifted down one. It should be like that, though my scale that I drew wasn't very good. They have the exact same scale. They should be identical, except they went down. So is that how you know mathematically that a line is a parallel, two lines are parallel on the graph, they have the same slope? Exactly. They have the same slope, exactly right. Exactly. It's like, um, what if you made like a, instead of three, four, how do you make it go from, instead of going down, one, how do you get it to where it goes <coughs> right or left? Um, that negative one or positive? That's a good question. Let's leave that for a different kind of function. It's easier to see when it's like a parabola versus a line. Because if you move a line down, it also looks like it moved. Does this look like it moved to the right? Yeah. We could look at it that way. Right? So to avoid confusion, let's leave the horizontal moving uh, or parabolas. We'll, we'll start with parabolas. Okay. Or maybe absolute values. Justin? Does that mean that perpendicular lines just the opposite reciprocal? Then? Opposite reciprocal, yes. Okay. So, but I'm going to prove that to you. First, parallel lines. What does parallel mean? Never, so never, never, mean. Cross. never cross. And if I want my lines to never cross, and I, I know that we could just say lines have y-intercepts and, and slopes. We could have lots of other characteristics, but these two things. If I want them to be parallel, I never ever want them to cross, then they better have the same slope, right? If this guy has a slope of 3 fifths, this one had better have the exact same slope of 3 fifths, okay? If this, well, if you have a bigger, like if your slope is a bigger number, Right, if I drew a line that has a bigger slope than this one, then where would they cross? If I had a point right here and I drew a, a line that has a bigger slope, like the numerical value of the slope is bigger. It would be on rising okay, So essentially the rise would be bigger, right? The numerator is bigger. So the slope. If, if it's bigger, it's a bigger number, then the rise of the run is bigger, so you can essentially say rise over, the rise is larger. So it's gonna rise more, rise faster than this guy, so a bigger slope they're gonna cross over, over there. It has a smaller slope, uh, somewhere over here. Right? It's rises smaller. So as you go that way, you're gonna wind up running into each other. In order not to run into each other, you gotta have the exact same slope. If this is A and this is B, then if I look at the slope of this guy right here, it better be A over B. Slopes are the same. I Is the same ratio? Same ratio, yeah. We get uh, three fourths here and six eighths here. Well, 6 a simplifies to 3 fourths, so again, they still have the same slope. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, 
Um, what does perpendicular mean? Cross at a 90 degree angle. There you go. Cross at a 90 degree angle. So I'm going to. So there are two lines that are perpendicular. I'm going to kind of spoil this and tell you that two perpendicular lines, as Justin said, are uh, they have opposite reciprocal slopes. So one's positive, the other's negative. One's three fourths, the other's negative four thirds. Okay. So for example, if one line has a slope of three fourths, then the reciprocal or the uh, the perpendicular line, if you got a slope of three fourths, then perpendicular line is a m equals negative four thirds. Let me prove that to you. Let's say that this is A and this is B. A and B. So what's the slope of this line? Three fourths. Well, we can't be exact because I haven't told you any numbers, right? Since it goes up and to the right, we know it's it is positive. This is a positive slope. So it has to be 3 4 A over B. Oh, I'm not saying choose. Oh. I'm saying it's A over B. That's, the, that's all we can know. It's A over B. Okay? Now let's look at this one. It's going to be a little bit tricky. I'm going to look at the rise of it. That was supposed to be green. I'm going to look at the rise. Now I get to pick the rise. I mean, you can go up and over. You can go up however much you want. You can go over. If you look at that ratio, that's the slope. Okay? You can simplify that, or you can uh, multiply it by the same number of the numerator and denominator, and you, it's, it's all the same ratio. Right? So I'm going to go up however much I want, and then I'm going to see how far over I have to go. So the amount up I'm going to go is B. So I get to pick that. I'm going to pick that I go up B. So now what I need to figure out is how big is that? If it's A, it's going to be in a negative direction, right? Then it would be negative U over A. So we just have to prove that that's A. How are we going to do that? Well, what's the angle right here? 90. 90. What's the angle right here? 90. 90. Okay. Let's call this angle yellow. You know that the, uh, since that one is a 90 degree angle, you know, yeah, and the purple one right there, that right there, if you go across, you know it's going to be perpendicular. Right there? It's like another perpendicular line inside of it. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Yeah, right there. Another perpendicular. Oh, okay, so yeah, that's a 90 as well. Uh, if, we, if we call that angle purple, or sorry, yellow, and we call this other angle uh, orange, So you know, uh, no, because that is perpendicular. No, then you know that they're going to be the same, the same one right there, the same. So what's the same? The same slope. Um, I don't know if that's enough to know that they're going to have. Even though uh, it's, so, so. Uh, it, it, it's perpendicular, but that's not enough to tell if it's going to be the same slope or not. Not, no, not quite. Okay. We're almost there though. Um, how many, how many degrees in a, in all the angles of a triangle? 180. 180, okay. How many angles, or how many degrees are here? 90. How many angles are between these two? 90. They add up to 90. We don't know what they are, but we do know they add up to 90. Yeah, 90. Right? How about this orange angle plus this little guy? What does that add up to? 90. Right, this plus that is 90. We know that because the lines are perpendicular. Right? So how big is this angle? 90. No, this one right here. It's the same angle as the yellow one? It's also the yellow angle. Whoa. Well, if that's yellow, what does, what's this angle plus this angle? Since this is 90, what's this angle plus this angle? Orange. 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 So this is, well, it's 90, yes. Yeah, so this angle must be 90. Yellow and orange make purple. And so they're, they're at least similar triangles, right? Same angles. But they're actually congruent triangles because I picked this guy here to be B. So if this is B and these angles are the same as these angles, and this is B, then this must be A. A. Or if you want, negative A. Okay, so this slope is A over B. The slope of this perpendicular line must be negative B over A. So 
So there's a proof that perpendicular lines must have opposite reciprocal slopes. Not because of magic, not because somebody told you, because it's just the way it must be. Yeah, that's right there. There's actually, I uh, will uh, talk about it later. I'm not gonna go on into the tangents, it's my trademark. Um, so parallel lines, identical slopes. Perpendicular lines, so reciprocal slopes, here's an example of what I mean by opposite reciprocal. If one of them is three-fourths, the other one is negative four-thirds. What if you find the slopes of two lines and they're not parallel or perpendicular? They're just neither parallel nor perpendicular. There's not really a lot of other names for lines that are at other angles to each other. They just intersect. They just intersect somewhere. Yeah. They're not parallel and they don't intersect in this very specific way, so they just intersect, they intersect somewhere at some angle that it's not particularly interesting. Let's just say that there's a line, and it goes through two points. It goes to the point uh, seven comma eight and negative five comma three. Okay, line. Without just looking at the graph, I mean that that would be easy enough. If you could just count it off, it would go up this much and over this much, right? Mathematically. How would I figure out what the slope is? One third. Don't, yeah. don't just spat off of the formula. Just spat off the formula. <coughs> I need to figure out how far it is from here to there, right? I need to figure out the rise. Can someone clue me into how to find the rise? You take the eight minus three. Eight minus three. Will that give you this vertical change? Yes. Yes. It yeah. will. Well, it's a vertical change, and if I want to figure out how big that distance is, I can take this eight minus this three, bracket eight minus three, and that should give me, well, then I must go from here to there, I must go up five. Will that work for any two points? Can I just subtract the y of one of them minus the y of the other and get the vertical change? Yeah. What if one of them is a negative? Then it would be plus. Then it would be plus, and it would still work. We'll look at that in just a second. How about to get this horizontal change? Seven minus negative five. Plus five. Seven plus five, right? That's gonna give me that distance, but seven minus negative five makes it seven plus five, right? So it all works out. Seven minus negative five, that's seven plus five. That's 12. And that's how far horizontally I have to go. That's my run. So I guess that answered that question. Even if one of them is negative, it still works out. Because <clears throat> okay. in this case, we get a big thing minus a little bit leaves us the rest. And in this case, we get this full thing plus this full thing gives us the total horizontal change. So we took 8 minus 3. That'll work for any two points. Like this point, maybe 2, and this point, 1. We want to find the slope between them. What should we call these? This is x and y, but this is also x and y. We need to distinguish them a little bit. Right. So we call them x1 one one. and y1, x2 and y2. Those would be the y's and x's from their respective points. Right. Just call one of them one and call the other one two. And start subtracting away. I can take this y minus this y, y2 minus y1. And this x minus this x, We need to make sure that really important that this x and this y are from the same point. And this x and this y are from the other point. Okay. Also make sure you pay attention if you're subtracting a negative. If you're using this point and subtracting a negative, you're really adding. Okay. Um, are we allowed to like, or is it possible to like switch like the y1 and x1 to first? And then what yes, y2? it doesn't matter which point you call two and one. You could call this one one, this one two, or this one one and this one two. The important part, like I said, is these two are from the same point. These two are from the other point. Whichever one you choose, it doesn't matter. Because what will happen is, 
Sometimes in one way, if it's a negative slope, then we'll get a negative on top in one instance and a negative on bottom in another instance. Or if it's a positive slope, one way, one orientation of a point being called one, the other two will give you a positive over positive, the other way will give you negative over negative, which is the positive. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Why does it not matter? There's our little equation for the slope. So let's imagine a simple situation that has a linear function attached to it. Like, uh, let's say you have $45, okay? You have $45. Nothing has happened yet, right? You just have $45. Then let's say you go to work, okay? You have $45, then you go to work. What do you do at work, as far as money's concerned? Yeah. Yeah. Does it cost you money? Hopefully, if it costs you money to be at work, you get another job. You're earning money at work. So we start with $45, and we get more money. Right? How much more money? Probably you get paid by the hour. Right? So what's the X more money? We can even know a little bit more. If I tell you that you earn, what? What's a good average? 10 bucks an hour. 10 average? No. For a high school job? Well, What's that? Twelve bucks an hour. Twelve? Okay, let's say eight. Yeah. Twelve dollars an hour. What are you doing? Just as you I've heard something. Okay. Eight dollars per hour. Listen. Eight dollars per hour times. X hours. X hours. X hours. Well, notice your X is in hours. Your run, and your rise is in dollars, right? And what's going to be the answer? Like, what are you going to get? What's the units of your answer? Well, this is our dollars per hour. Once I plug in five hours, right? five times eight dollars per hour plus 45 will give me a number of what? Dollars, dollars right? Because like the hours get canceled. I add dollars to dollars to get dollars. So anytime you're looking at, and this is a linear function, isn't it? Y equals mx plus b. It's just the b and the mx are switched, but it doesn't make a big difference. This is what you call a rate of change. And then uh, could you put like negative 10 for like lunch? Negative 10 for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> like after the end. Minus $10 for lunch? For the. For the <laughs> we yeah. could even do minus, um, let's say, Let's say you're working a job that pays twenty dollars an hour. Okay, you're like an adult, but you also like have a kid and you're paying for daycare. Let's say you're paying for daycare the whole time. So you subtract. What does that cost per hour? Five. Five. Five dollars an hour. I'd say eight. Gross. I mean, that much. Right. Well, we're also going to take the number of hours x times five dollars an hour and subtract that from the money that we. Overall, though, we are making money per hour. How much money are we making per hour right now? $15. $15 per hour. We're making 20, we're losing five, so we're making 15 all together. Then you subtract taxes. Oh, then we don't need to worry about all of that. that. Car payment, oh, right? yeah. the house payment. All right, yeah, electric. <laughs> Last little bill. point here. Oh. A rate of change is just, it's just the slope. It's the ratio at which y changes as x changes. Right? Y changes as X changes. The change in Y versus the change in X. Let's just go back to the slope here. Change in Y versus change in X. Okay? In calculus or physics, we call this delta Y over delta X. This is this Greek letter delta just means change in. Change in Y? How much did Y change? Five. How much did X change? Twelve. Okay? This could be five dollars for every twelve hours. This could be five miles for every twelve hours. This could be five inches for every 12 years, this could be anything, okay? What we'll wind up getting is whatever units Y is in, dollars, say, over whatever units X is in, hours, let's say, okay? So we just get a rate, what's called a rate of change. How is Y changing with respect to X? Should I 
tells you how much y changes every time x changes a certain amount. And we could be talking about, again, dollars per hour. We could talk about feet per uh, second. We could be talking about inches per year. Right? Is inches per year an interesting rate of change? Yeah. Hawaii is moving at a rate of, in a matter of inches per year, I think it's like four inches per year. Things move that slowly. Glaciers. Glaciers move very, very slowly. So that slope is just a rate of change. The change in y versus the change in x. I'll say it again, the change in y versus the change in x. Is it dollars per hour, inches per year, feet per second? Well, it all depends on what y is measured in and what x is measured in. Let's get that rate of change. Um, any questions? 